All right, Genesis, the foundation book of the Bible, lesson number 10. I'm going to talk about the creation of man here in a minute. All right, just a little review as we do every, uh, every lesson. So far, Genesis has recorded two essential acts of creation. Number one, the creation of the inanimate world. And in the inanimate world, of course, matter, atmosphere, vegetation, so on and so forth. Inanimate world, no consciousness. And then the creation of the animate world, fish, birds, animals, conscious life. It's interesting, you know, when you break it down, you see there's a pattern to this. You know? So in verse 26, we're still in chapter one of, Mos uh, of, Moses, of, of Genesis, Moses begins to record the third act of creation, and that is the creation of spiritual life. So inanimate, animate, spiritual life. And we read in verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Um, some scholars refer to this verse as the divine counsel the divine counsel. Uh, this was not the first such counsel. Many other things have happened before time was created, before the creation of the world, which had been decided by the Godhead. For example, the decision to sacrifice Jesus for the sins of the world, that decision was made before the world was made. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. So before the world, the decision for salvation has been made. Another example, the names of those who would receive Christ written in the book of life. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come out of the abyss and go to destruction and those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. In other words, the ones who are not Christians, they're going to wonder about the beast. They're going to not understand what's going on. Not so for those who know the truth, for those who are written in the book of life, the names that God has known from before the beginning of the world. I know we can, we can get into you know, predestination here and so on and so forth. I don't want to get into that discussion. Suffice to say that this is an example of God's foreknowledge, meaning that God knows what's going to happen before it happens because He's outside of the time continuum. Okay? He's outside of time. So He knows what's going to happen before it happens. That doesn't necessarily mean that He decides what's going to happen man still has free will. It's simply that God knows what man will choose because he's outside of, outside of time. All right, so note that the dialogue does not address the angels. The Godhead, the council, divine council, never talks to the angels because the angels are not made in the image of God. Man is made in the image of God. So the exchange within the Godhead appears in other places. When I talk about the divine council, I'm talking about an exchange between the Godhead. Very interesting concept. For example, in Psalm 110, a familiar passage, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord said to my Lord. He wasn't talking to himself. In Isaiah 48, it says, come near to me, listen to this. From the first I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there, and now the Lord God has sent me and His Spirit. See, different characters, different persons. John 17, 24, Father, Jesus is saying, Father, talking to the Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus is talking to God. Jesus is God, He's talking to the Father. You and me, that's, that's two, divine counsel. Divine counsel. 
So this is one of the earliest glimpses that we have of the nature of God. I mean, not John 17, but Genesis is what I'm talking about here. From these verses, we learn several things about God. For example, we learn that God communicates. God is communicative in the sense that ideas are part of His nature and the exchange of them is possible. And we have a record, you know, we record in the Bible, or He has recorded in the Bible, His exchange of ideas not only with man, but within the Godhead itself. You know, gods of other religions are many times simply a force. There's no idea that comes out. There's no idea that's communicated. It's just a kind of a, a force, non-personal type of force. We also find out that God has a multi-person nature. In other words, God has a multi-person nature because the verse refers to one God and, yes, there is, and yet there is an exchange within the Godhead. So this is where the idea of the Trinity comes in. I hear people say sometimes, the Trinity, well, you know, try to find the word Trinity in the Bible. Well, you won't find it. It's not in the Bible. But the concept is there, the explanation of it is there. The reality of it is there. It's talking about God. Jesus is God and He's talking to the Father and then He's talking about the Spirit who is also God. So there's, we're limited as human beings simply because of the language limits us and the, the, our ability to, to bring in a concept. So the best way that we have found to describe this is we call God the Godhead and you know, three in one. You know. That's how we try to explain it. Another thing we find out is that man's creation is a result of design because it says before the foundation of the world this happened and that happened and so on and so forth. So the creation of man was designed and not an outgrowth of existing creatures. God had a concept of what man would be. He's not simply the result of some evolutionary development. Now, the terms image you know, or likeness, will make them in our image and in our likeness. These terms mean, among other things, resemblance, figure, model, shape. The Hebrew word used there to translate. So man is made to resemble or modeled after God. All right, some of the things that we note about man's creation. For example, the term man is the same as Adam and is related to the earth. In Hebrew, Adama. Adama means earth. Okay? So this is given to the first human made because he is essentially created from the same elements that the other cre creatures are created from the elements that have already been created, basically the earth. He creates man from the elements of the, of the earth. That's why he calls him Adam of the earth. Also the term Adam is used in a formal way as the actual name of the first man, but it's only used there in Genesis chapter 2 verse 19. But the two terms are, you know, they're interchangeable. Okay? Another thing we learn is that Adam has a triune nature that reflects the triune nature of the Godhead. He has, first of all, a body formed like the bodies of the inanimate creation. He's made of matter. Then we find out he has consciousness like the animate creatures. In other words, like the inanimate creation, the earth and so on. You know, his physical body is made out of the same things. You know, what is it, our body is 80% water or something like that? I need someone who knows more about that than I do, but some, something like that. How much? 90%. Is it 90%? Okay, so, but it's, we're made of the same elements. That's why you know, when, when someone is buried into the ground, eventually, you, given enough time, you can't tell anymore that someone was there, it'll just disintegrate into the earth. But he also has consciousness, like the 
animate creatures such as birds and animals. So he is aware of himself. That's called the soul. Some people refer to that, that self-awareness, that consciousness, that uh, sentient life as the soul. And then he also possesses the spiritual character of God, which encompasses qualities like his willpower, a sense of morality, right, wrong, the ability to communicate with every aspect of creation, as well as other human beings, as well as God. So man can communicate with in, inanimate object, in other words, a man can work the, the soil to grow things and he can move the rocks around to build a road and you know, so on. He can harness the energy of the earth to, to do things, so he can communicate, if you wish, with inanimate matter. He can also communicate with animate matter. In other words, he can call, train his dog to do tricks and ride a horse and tame animals and farm and uh, um, ranch you know, and so on and so forth. He can raise animals, so he can communicate with animals and so on and so forth. But then in addition to that, he can also communicate with other human beings and he can communicate with God. So there you have his triune nature. He is made in the image of God. He is a multiple type, he has a multiple personality, if you wish. Now, that animals communicate with each other in various ways, that they communicate with human beings in limited ways, that's true, that doesn't prove anything. I mean, they, my, my, my cat used to communicate with me. He was happy to see me. Why? I represented food, right? Your dog, oh, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy you're here. Uh, what, what does he want? He wants you to play with him, he wants you to feed him. But he never asks you, what time is it? And he doesn't say, how was your day? No, 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 I don't want to bark. You tell me about your day first. <laughs> no. <laughs> but only man is able to perceive God and only man is able to communicate with God. This is the witness of his spiritual nature. Now an important idea here is that the spirit of man is in the image of God. Among other things mentioned, it is eternal. Unlike the life of an animal which is temporal. When a man dies, his body goes to the dust and his spirit goes to God for judgment. When an animal dies, his body goes to dust and his consciousness ceases. And I bring up an interesting passage here that people always bring up, animal lovers many times, Ecclesiastes 3.21 where Solomon says, who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of beast descends downward to the earth. And what he's doing here, he's not stating something, he's asking a question. He's asking, how do we know what happens after life? How do we know for sure you know, that human beings somehow go on and animals go down to the ground? You know, how do we know that? Well, you know, remember, Ecclesiastes was written by someone who was skeptical. Vanity of vanities, he says, you know, life is vanity. He was skeptical, he was doubting. How do I know what happens after life? Of course, we know, don't we? We, we have the revelation of Jesus Christ. We know what happens after life, you know? Hebrews, you know? it is given to man to die once and then comes the, the judgment. So we know what happens after life, the judgment. Okay? So don't get bamboozled when somebody pulls out Ecclesiastes 3.21 to prove that Fido is in dog heaven somewhere, okay? Because that's not a good support scripture for that. So before the world was created, God knew what it would be like. He knew how it would function and He also knew of the fall of man and planned for it as well as having decided the manner of sacrifice and who would offer that sacrifice and who would receive that sacrifice. He knew all of this before, which brings up an interesting question that people normally bring up at this point. All of this God knew in advance but he went ahead and created man anyways on the sixth day. Why did he do that? I mean, all the suffering and the sin, and you know, why did he do that? 
The answer is partly in Ephesians chapter one, verse nine. It's longer than this, but I just quote this verse here. He's talk, here, Paul's talking about God. He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him. In other words, God through the gospel has allowed us to know what His will was. And what was His will? That eventually Jesus would come and save man from sin. You know, that's what he's saying here. But notice when he says the mystery of His will. God has willpower. He decides, you know, I have an option, I choose this or I choose that. Okay, with me so far? So now before the foundation of the world, God knows in advance what's going to happen. So he has a choice of three things. Number one, he doesn't create. He doesn't go ahead and do it. Not too much trouble, it's a headache. You know. Sin, destruction, ugh, the flood. The Jewish people have to put up with them for a couple of thousand years, you know, hard-hearted, stubborn. And then, you know, oh, and then my son is going to have to die on the cross. You know, uh, who, who wants this kind of grief? So that was, so maybe I'll just shut it down. We don't create anything. We just stay the way we are. That, that's one choice. Choice number two, well, let's create mankind, but let's create him in a way that he can't you know, disobey. You know, when I look at him and I say, do you love me? He will always say, I love you. And when I say, will you obey me? He will always obey me. And whenever there's a test or anything like that, he will always obey. I'm just going to program it into him. There's no way he can disobey. I think we call that a zombie. Or number three, I've tried, I've asked people to give me, give me, another, give me a fourth thing, you know, but the third thing is, will I create him with free will and it'll, ha you know, what happens, happens. So someone says, well, how do we know he made the right decision? And the answer to that is, can God make a wrong decision? No. So the fact that we live now in a time when we can look back and see the creation, the history of the Jewish nation, sin, the fall, you know, all of that, Christ died, resurrect the church, all the way into the 21st century, we know that because this is what God has chosen, that we know that that was the correct choice. That was the mystery of His will. His will was expressed, expressed perfectly in Jesus Christ. Okay? Because the other two options would not have been perfect. To create man with free will, that was the perfect decision in that context. How do we know? That's the decision He made. All right, so let's look at um, man's position. Verse 26b, it says, we go back to the original cha Genesis chapter one, it says, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we see here that man is not just another animal evolved from lower animals. He has a distinct nature apart from animals and his position in creation is not something that occurs as a result of survival of the fittest. It is a position naturally given to him by God. God says, you know, go forth and multiply and, and have dominion over the birds and over the, 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 the animals and over the fish and so on and so forth. He has a position. The term dominion means to reign or to rule over. Now this rulership is less like a, you know, like a king who rules, more like the idea that the creation is in cooperation with man to support him and to see to his needs. In other words, man is God's partner in the management of the creation. Verse 27, the actual act of creation, it says, God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. So verse 26 is the preamble that describes what God is about to do and the nature of man once he is created. This is the only part of creation that has this feature. 
So in the creation there's another feature described and that is the dual nature of mankind. I want you to note the same pattern is followed in creating man. The generic or the essence of the new creation is formed, right? So previously that would be inanimate or animate. Then the variation is made. So in the inanimate and animate fields, you have the creation of the essential matter first, and then matter is then formed into vegetation and fish and birds and so on and so forth. Okay? Now in the creation of man, God forms the spiritual essence of man, and that is he is made in the likeness of God. Then he creates the variation of that essence, and that is male and female. Okay, so at the beginning, he creates the essence, just matter, and then he energizes it, and then he, 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 he gives it form, you know, various things. Well, in creating man, he creates the essence of man, which is what? That he's in the likeness of God. And then he creates varieties of that essence, male, female. I want you to note only two varieties, not three or four or six, two, okay? All right, so an important point here is that both male and female share this similar essence as spiritual beings, higher than animals, eternal like God. There will be some differences as to form and role which will be given later, but the essence is the same. So you know, when they talk about you know, women, uh, you know, women's rights and, uh, with men. Yeah, why? Sure, of course. Why? Because in essence, they're exactly the same as man. They're made in the image of God. They're spiritual beings, eternal creatures. Now their role and their function and their um, psychology is different than, than men, but the essence is the same. So this is the general description of the creation of men that we have at this point in Genesis and the placement of where this act fits into the sequence of the six days of creation. Now later, Moses will kind of telescope in to the details of this creation and what actually happens to man once he's created. No more explanations about the birds, no more explanation about the stars. After this description of the six days of creation, the narrative will shift to tell the story of man, his fall, and then how God saves him. And that's exactly, that's the entire story of the Bible. Somebody says to you, what's the Bible about? Well, it's about the creation of man, <laughs> the beginning of Genesis, uh, then his fall, you know, the next couple of chapters of Genesis, and then how God worked to save him from Genesis you know, like nine or 10 or something, all the way to the end of Revelation is just about God, how God worked through history to save man. It's very simple, three steps, okay? All right, so now we'll look at verse 28 to 31. We'll read that in a minute. And this is now God's charge to man. He's created the essence. He's formed the variations, male and female. Now He's going to charge them, okay? Now we need to realize that there are two worlds here that are very different for us to imagine and understand because they're not like the world we live in. One is the world to come, the new heaven and the new earth. They describe it somewhat in the book of Revelation symbolically. It's just hard to get our mind around what that world will be like, like no natural light, God will be the light. You know? Nobody's sick, nobody tired, nobody, nobody dying, no hunger, no, none of that, no physical needs, no need for marriage. So different than the existence that we have here, because those are all things we so depend on. I mean, let there be a, a, a blackout, you know, we lose the electricity, oh my, you know, for a day or two days, it's terrible. You know? oh, there's not going to be any of that. Where, so that's the, the new heavens and earth. You know, it's hard to imagine what that place will be like. But there's also another world that's hard for us to imagine, and that's the pre-sin world of Adam and Eve. That also is very different than the world that we live in today. Okay? So keep that in mind when we talk about, especially in these chapters of Genesis, we're talking about the pre-sin world, very different physical environment 
that we live in today. This is why some of the explanations seem strange to us because they explain another world of which ours only bears a resemblance. So let's read verses 28 to 31. It says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to every thing that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. All right, so after the general description of the uh, creation uh, and the creation of man and women, uh, woman, God gives them instructions about what they're to do. It's a charge, He charges them. Some interesting notes about that charge and that world are the following. Whoops, I'm sorry, I forgot to read uh, 31. And it says, and God saw all that He had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. All right, now. God's charge to man. First charge, only one man and one woman are created. Now, it, it, it seems that there are many pairs of animals created since it says that swarms were made and they abundantly filled the earth. So lots of animals, only one of each, man and woman. And there was to be only one of each, man and woman, in the that's where we go to to find our base model, our template for marriage. Number two, and I make a, a kind of parenthetical statement here, you know, the laws of the land can legalize a union and give legal rights to a union between two men or two women or three women and one man or you know, any combination. The law can give them a, a, a certain rights, if you wish, legal rights, and they can call it marriage, you know, and we seem to be going in that direction in our society, okay? But I mean, fighting it from a legal perspective, you know, sometimes seems futile. The thing we need to remember is the template for marriage is not found in the Constitution. It's found in the Bible, okay? Sometimes they say, well, how can you not call it marriage if the Supreme Court calls it marriage? My answer to that, without disrespecting the Supreme Court, is simply to say, my template for marriage is what the Bible teaches what marriage is, irregardless of what society does or does not do. It's great for us that society confirms the template that we've always looked to. That's terrific, you know, we were in the good times, you know, but if we go through a bad time in society where society moves away from a Christian perspective legally, we, you know, sometimes we're powerless to stop that. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, we stay with the template. You know, maybe the Supreme Court can, can kind of honor your relationship, but the Bible doesn't. So that's, as Christians, that's where we need to stick to. Anyway, I don't want to get off on that tangent. Secondly, he says, fill the earth. So the first command is to fill the earth with mankind. God made this command with the full knowledge of the earth's ability to sustain mankind. Overpopulation, believe it or not, is not due to God's lack of planning, but rather poor management and distribution of resources and wars and greed. You know, bad land management was the reason for the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma back in the 30s. Not because God didn't send enough rain or the nature or whatever. You know, if, you, if you study that, you find that the, the, the people who were managing the land here did things which you, know, uh, you should not have done with the land, remove the trees or so on and so forth. And you find that a lot of times when people are starving in a certain nation, it's not because there's not enough food in the world, it's because some government is using that as a tactic for political reasons. There's plenty of food. I mean, there was a time we were burning food and throwing it away in order to keep the prices up. And even that, you know, man's greed, okay? Overpopulation not due to lack of planning. 
Um, the earth can sustain its present population with its technology and resources. It's the sin in the world that creates the problems of misery, not God. Don't blame God for that. Number three, manage the creation. To subdue and have dominion doesn't mean to exploit ruthlessly the environment. It means to understand and manage the creation for the good of all its inhabitants. You know, we have to find ways to get oil out of the ground you know, the way we need it without destroying the ground. Because <laughs> we also live here. And surely there's a way to do that. A lot of times we don't do it. Why? Money. You know, money. The greedy companies will, will find the fastest, cheapest way to exploit for the greatest profit. But sometimes what's profitable to a company is not profitable for the inhabitants of the actual land. And you know, the right, just thing to do, the biblical thing to do, is to find that balance. Exploiting the resources without destroying the, the creation. You know, science to understand, technology to develop, and use the resources for the benefits of everyone. In that perfect world, the order was evident and open to understanding. The creation was also compliant for development and exploration. There were not issues of survival. They were a, a, an exercise of joy and discovery. You know, exploiting the creation for food and so on and so forth was a joyful thing before sin. The, the creation cooperated with man. Number four, he, he gives them a diet. Man was originally given the vegetation to eat. The suggestion is that before sin, they ate no meat. Now it's not clear if the same was true for animals, although it seems that the two were given the vegetation to eat. I mean, it's specifically stated. All the, green, all the greenery, all the, all the vegetation was yours to eat for the animals and for the people. Now, men may have begun to eat meat after the sin of Adam in disobedience to God. In other words, it says Jabal introduced cattle raising in Genesis chapter 4, verse 20. God gave man permission to eat meat. We know for sure after the flood, Genesis 9, he actually specifies that I've given you now the animals to eat. A lot of reasons for that. Animals may have been kept under population control in the pre-sin world by God in order to, to avoid any predatory uh, cycle. After the sin of Adam or after the flood, animals began to be meat eaters themselves. One person, one thing that I read said, well, they needed the protein because now the climate was changed. It was cold, it was hot, it was cold, and so on and so forth, no control. So if God can create the world, He may have kept it in balance without the need for killing or meat eating. These activities may have come after the curse, certainly came after the flood. Give me another minute, I'm almost done here. And then he sees that all is good. He sees that every single thing he had made was very good. So if he sees that every single thing that he has made is very good, then that suggests certain things. Number one, there's no death because death is the result of sin and everything he says is good, so there's no dying. It also suggests you know, there are no fossils because these are the result of death. We can explain the fossil records through the flood, through the, 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 the consequences of the, of the flood, and we'll talk about that later. Another interesting thing, no devil. No devil, the Bible says that he looked at everything that he had made. That includes the angels because the angels were made by God and they were present when God created the world. So if God saw that everything that he made was very good at this point, it may mean that everything is good and without sin and that includes Lucifer, he also rejoiced at this point. His rebellion then must have come later along in his fall, along with his fall. Like I said, he may have been jealous of man's creation and God's likeness and his role, along with other angels, in serving man. The Bible says that they're messengers, they're our messengers, and they're also our servants. This is, let, let's separate speculation here, okay? So I'm speculating, I'm just saying maybe what happened was that 
Satan left his position. His position was that he was to serve man on behalf of God. Maybe he didn't want to do that. He wanted to rise above that. And because of that, he was cast down. And so we see his everlasting enmity between himself and man. Just speculation, things to think about. So the final act is the creation of man and the charge to inhabit the earth, to learn about and manage the creation for the good of all. This is his responsibility towards the creation. That's man's responsibility. All right, next time we come back, uh, we'll look at his responsibility toward God and the details of the Sabbath and uh, man and woman's uh, foundation. In other words, more details as far as that's concerned. Okay, that's it for this time. Thank you for your attention.